Bless the Beasts and Children by Glidden Swarthout. Chapter 7. I gotta eat. Crack a wine. Pop pastrami and a pickle and a strawberry shake. We're not stopping, Cotton said. We don't have time and you know it. So am I starving, said the other one. My gut doesn't know it, Chicka said. Me for food. Glorious food. She climbed over the side of the bed and stood in the street, gnawing at her fingernail. It's a go on without me and have fun. Me too, said Valley One. You can't order us around all the time, Cotton. Cotton was, uh, was irate. They had stopped for a red light that fringed Flagstaff, and now the light was green. Get the hell back in here. Up yours, Shaker said. I've sat in back all the way. I should get something. We do what we want, cried Valley One. As far as Cotton was concerned, that tied it. Tess and Goodenough had their heads out the cab window. Okay, leave him, he ordered Tess. Go on, leave him. Tess obeyed, and the truck moved away, and the mutineers began walking, and none of them could quite believe what was happening, that the bedwetters were breaking up, zap, pow, just like that, over nothing, and they were nearly there. But in less than a block, Cotton pounded on the window and ordered Tess to pull over, and in a minute, Shekhar and Ali One caught up with them. Cotton said okay to get in. Everybody was probably pretty hungry and would operate better after some food. So get in and hit the floor while they looked for a place. There'd be a lot more fuzz and flag than there had been in Prescott. Put good now and back with them and slid beside Valley 2 in the cab and they started again. Intersecting with the main street, Tess turned right. This was US 66, the central east-west conduit of the nation. In the good old days, guiding on a tall pine trimmed with bows, known then as a flagstaff, wagon trains had watered at the springs here and bedded down for the night. Now the town was a day's run out of Los Angeles and its main street, US 66, was a caravansary of ten-dollar rooms, diesel spatter, clogged urinals, tubercular waitresses, anti-sleep pills, yesterday's pastry, flat tires, paper diapers, cigarette butts, and exhausted coffee, as tawdry by night as well as depressing by day. Cotton told Tess to turn off, away from the rat race, and on to a side street. It was now 1.51 a.m. Against the transient parental environment, which was overstimulating and unpredictable as well, Billy Lally's defense was to withdraw into a world of fantasy, self-created, into an isolation to which he admitted no one. His case was complicated by his discovery that the more completely he regressed, the greater advantage this gave him over Stephen, his older brother. The withdrawal became for him both a necessity and a device. It was habitual now, with attendant infantile practices. Besides wetting his bed and sucking his thumb, he had bad dreams and suffered night terrors. His parents twice enrolled him in special schools, only to take him out to travel with them. At various times, he began treatment with four different therapists, one of them in Switzerland, only to have his father and mother reconcile and pack their suitcases. At 12, he was the youngest camper, and underage by restrictions, but his parents could not have gone to Kenya without disposing of both sons somewhere, and the director was persuaded to make an exception. Cotton's cabin was his second. When, in the first, he withdrew under his bed with the foam rubber pillow from home and curled into a ball in his sleeping bag, the other boys hauled him out, screaming as though ripped from the womb. He burrowed back in. They hauled him out again. The sport went on until Cotton came by and offered to take Billy Lally with him. With him, Cotton asserted, he could hide under his bed whenever he needed to, or up a tree, or in a cave for all he cared, or any damn where. Hold it, Cotton said. Over there, park, and I'll make a recon. He got out and crossed the dim street and spied into a yellow window, then returned and said to come on, this would do, and they piled out, leaving the engine running and stowing the rifle on the cab floor. The place was an all-night beer and beanery with a griddle behind the counter and a mechanical bowling alley crowded between rickety chairs and tables. Two young men were drinking beer and bowling, and on the floor, his head against the wall, an elderly Navajo snoozed in silver hair and a green velvet shirt. The bedwetters lined up on stools and short ordered from the limited menu on the wall, two hamburgers each and a pint of milk. The counterman was bony and ketchup-eyed, and his chin had the contours of a spatula. On the wall beside the menu was this notice, fly specs. Our credit manager is Helen Waits. If you want credit, go to Helen Waits. Balls trundled on the alley and pins clattered and bells rang, but when the game was over, the only sounds on the beanery were the hiss of grease and the caterwaul issuing from two jacket pockets of Grandpa Jones from three of Gladys Knight and the Pips. Glasses in hand, the two bullers came up behind the six boys at the counter. There were young men, 20 or so, in tight jeans and sassy western shirts and big belt buckles and long sideburns. 
What you milk drinkers doing out so late by yourselves? Asked one. Waiting for their hamburgers, the bedwitters started to straw and milk from the cartons. How can we listen to all them radios? Asked the other. The musicians, Shaker said. A rock outfit, drums, four guitars, and a front singer from L.A. Musicians, huh? You got a name? Group therapy, said Taft. Then we changed to after death, said Goodnow, but that was too morbid. What are you now? The before Christ, Shaker said. Before Christ? I think our backs, man. The sideburns studied the BCs on the backs of jackets, and they studied the miscellany of headgear along the counter. Want an autographed picture? asked Ali One. Give us a listen on the groovy label, said Goodnow. The sideburns were not amused. Ask what we was doing out so late, said One. Now let's hear, let's hear. In the West, said Teft, apropos of nothing in particular, everything sticks, stings, or stinks. We're on tour, Shaker said. Also, we're talent scouts looking for local, vocal talent. Sure, said Valley, sing something. We like it, and we might wax you. We're from a boys' camp near Prescott, Cotton said quickly. We've been camping out, and now we're on our way back. Walking? We've got a car. The sideburns snorted. None of you sonnies old enough to drive. You learn guitar, and you might be as big as Simon and Garfunkel, Shekel said. Anything I can't abide, said one of the sideburns, reaching for Shekel's milk and pouring beer from his glass down the straw. He's a drip-lipped dude kid. Would you like to know who my father is, Shekhar said. Okay, Cotton's off at school. Okay, you guys, let's go. He had his wall out, and dropping a five on the counter, motioned at the door. Let's go, we're late. But I'm hungry, said Lally Koo. I said let's go, Cotton cried, his voice so shrill that it woke the Navajo in the green velvet shirt, and the counterman dropped the plastic mustard dispenser, and the other five were on the floor and ahead of him out the door like scalded cats. Walk, don't run, he said, his voice low now. Walk into that damn truck and let's roll. Don't look back. Pack natural and keep moving. Just as they reached the pickup and were going over the tailgate and into the cab, the beanery door opened and the two locals stepped outside and watched as Teft pulled away from the curb. Why do we have to leave, demanded Goodnow, who was up front with Cotton. What's the matter with those jerks? Gunslingers, Cotton said, out for fun and games and we can't take chances. Uh-oh, Teft said. He had turned left and intersected again with US-66 and waiting for a green light, stared into the big side mirror on the Chevy. Trouble. I think it's them. The local mafia. See if they tail us when we turn. The light changed, and Teft swung onto the interstate. They following? Yup. Cotton knocked on the cab window. It yelled and yelled at those in back to lie low, then banged his helmet liner on the dash. Damn it, to be almost there and run into those hoods and check or get funny in a New York accent. Anyway, stay in the speed limit till we're out of town. We can't afford to have the fuzz after us, too. They snailed along at 35 for a mile, through a warn of motels and gas stations, and half a mile at 45, watching for the city limit sign. Cotton asked what kind of car the gunslingers were driving, and Teft said a real rod, a 63 Plymouth, he thought, which, he, which had been a hot model. You could guess they'd souped it up, a pair of four-barrel cabs and a full house cam at least, and chopped the front end. He would run rings around this thing. What do they want, Goodnow asked faintly. Cut us down, Teft said, once we're out of town. Pass and make us pull off. Then what? Show us their talent. Talent? Sure. Sing for us. Suddenly the lights behind them blinked once, twice, three times. And the hard top zoomed even with them and stayed even, though Teft stepped on it. Then drew slightly ahead and began to bear right, bearing down on the front fender of the pickup and offering two alternatives only. Pull over or collide. Teft held course as long as he dared. Cotton, he said finally, I've never done this before. I'm chicken. Pull over, Cotton said. Good now, put the hands over his face. What will we ever, ever do? Teft braked gradually and left the highway, and they chunked over gravel and came to a stop as the Plymouth crowded in close ahead of them and doused its lights. In their own lights, they could see its wide, smooth tires, racing slicks and extending from beneath it, puttering at them four scavenger pipes. The two locals strolled back toward the Chevy. Even at second survey, they did not seem mean or menacing. They were as clean and shaven and good-looking, actually, as old Wheaties. But there was a scary difference. Old Wheaties were stupid. They were merely mindless. Wheaties had a locker full of vices and a gizzard full of platitudes. They seemed to be unmotivated. Cotton put the twenty-two on the cab floor and said to sit tight and stuck his head out the window and told the three in back to sit tight and no damn jokes. Well said, one local. It ain't the before Christ. Howdy. Lights off, said the other. Teft turned them off. Didn't meet your num-dum, said one. Everybody out, said the other. 
Some swift adults, they waited on the highway side while six boys climbed out and ranged themselves opposite along the shoulder side of the pickup. How's come if you're in a camp over to Prescott or headed for Albuquerque, asked one. No one answered. Let's turn off that engine, said one sideburn. Putting his head and arm into the cab, he ducked out. I'll be a suck egg mule. No keys. Hey, you got this thing wired, grinned the other. What do you guys want, Cotton asked. Don't fuss now, one said. Let's see what else. He bent over the bed. What the? They both looked, then stood back grinning at the line of boys across the pickup with their sober, stubborn faces as traffic passed. This ain't something to see in the night. Six milk drinkers in a wired car and fancy hats with half a pillow and a buffalo head with a bullet hole in it. What do you want, Cotton demanded. One local scratched his head. I don't know now. Me neither, said the other. Tell you what, said the first. Let's let the law know and flag what we got here. They'd be obliged to hear about a wired car. Then they'd owe us a favor. You're right, agreed the other. You truly do have talent. Like to see something else, Tep asked. Surely would. Tep stood next to the cab. The door was open. Taking one step, he was out of sight for five seconds. They heard a click. When he reappeared, he laid the barrel of the rifle across the flange top of the truck bed. You got a pop gun, said one sideburn. Smile when you say that, stranger, Tep said. You wouldn't have the hair. Tep took another step backward and turning, raised the twenty two, aimed and fired. There was a high pitched explosion after the rifle crack, then a lugubrious sigh, and the thunder settled perceptibly to the right. He had punctured one of the racing slicks. They put him aboard the plane at Kennedy like a prisoner. His father pulled strings and boarded with him and guarded him until they detached the loading ramp from the aircraft. There were 18 other boys aboard for the flight to Phoenix, and a dozen more were due to board when they landed at O'Hare in Chicago. No one was supposed to complain. Tep did, though. Service personnel caught him after a merry chase round and round the terminal and half walked, half carried him aboard again. The continuation to Phoenix was nonstop, <clears throat> and Tep made it a memorable flight for crew and passengers. After he tried to open an emergency kit at 35,000 feet, the first officer belted him into his seat, arms and all. Over Kansas, the stewardesses allowed him to go to the john. On the way aft, he flipped open an overhead hatch and ripped out an oxygen mask by the roots, providing an excuse for several grandmotherly females who were convinced this would decompress the cabin and give them the bends to have nervous breakdowns. In the john, he locked the door and refused to come out. Before the first officer could force the occupied lock with a screwdriver, Tep jammed the Kleenex and toilet paper and soap and towels down the head and ran water into the washbowl till the john floor was flooded. The crew belted him into a window seat and posted a stewardess, but as New Mexico appeared below him, he ceased to struggle and hunched forward, gazing open mouth. Lawrence Tep III was from Mamaroneck, New York. He had seen country like this in Western, but he had never believed the illimitable red rock, red rock land was real. None of them could comprehend it. Behind the barrier of the pickup, the bed letters stood at attention like tin soldiers. Before the two locals could react, Tep ejected, chambered a second round, clicked the bolt home, laid the barrel of the rifle over the top of the bed, again leaned, sighted on them. I got the hair, Tep said too loudly, and I got another BB in here, and you start for flag or I'll hang it in your ear. This close I can't miss, so start walking or one of you country and western hippies can wear earrings. The sideburns stared at him. You hear me, hippies, Tep shouted. I said, move, move it. Partner, you're going to pay for this, said one. They did start, their boots crunching gravel, their figures enlarged by the sweep of headlights and diminished as darkness cut them down to size. When they were a hundred yards away, Cotton pushed the button. In the truck, fast, come on, let's roll. They jumped into the bed in the cab and Cotton grabbed the twenty two from Tep and unloaded as soon as the Chevy was geared up and hightailing down the interstate again. They let loose. Yay, Tep. What hair? Dalton's right again. Earrings. Nothing stops us. Tep, goddammit. Tep, I can't tell you, Cotton warbled. That was beautiful. Beautiful. 